here at the Peabody Public Library in Columbia City on January 29, 2004. We are interviewing a, uh, Mr. James Yaney from Columbia City. Mr. Yaney, what's your date of birth? August 8, 1931. And what uh, branch of the service did you serve in? In the United States Army Medical Corps. And which war were you, uh, during which war did you serve? I served in the Korean War. Um, Mr. Yaney, uh, when did you uh, first enter the service? I entered the service in 1953, and I, well, I arrived in Korea the, the same year, in 1953. And were you drafted into the service? I was drafted into the service, yes. And before you were drafted, what were you doing? Before that there, I was a spray painter at the International Harvester Company in Fort Wayne. Okay. And, um, and, but you went into the uh, MASH, uh, the, um, medical when I when I went in the service I was sent to Camp Pickett Virginia which was a basic training and a medical center where they trained medics okay and I received my training there and from there of course I was sent overseas okay but you weren't a doctor before you went into the no. war okay you were sent overseas. Um, What was life around in, uh, were you living in Columbia City at that time or Fort Wayne? No, I lived in Fort Wayne all my life up till 1992 when I retired from the school system and I, my wife and I moved down here to Columbia City. Mr. Severe, Jack Severe, who lives here, he was a teacher there at Northwood Middle School and he always recommended me to come here as long as Bob Gates also was dead now and uh, this is where we decided to reside. Um, what was like, life like in Fort Wayne? Back then? What about the time you uh, enlisted, or uh, when you were drafted, I'm sorry. I think it was very simple. Uh, it was a very happy time. It was a family era. Uh, were, did, were you married at that time? When I went into the service? Uh -huh. No. I was single when I went into the service. And uh, I, it was time for family, and it was just a real fine time period of my life, which I'll never forget. Before you drafted, had you heard much about Korea? Well, yes. Since I come from a military family, my father was a, uh, he went up through the ranks from private lieutenant colonel. And uh, I had, my three brothers were in World War II. And it was always my thought that if I ever missed the service, that I would probably be looked down upon in my family. But uh, luck wasn't to uh, have it that way. So you were drafted and they sent you to? Camp Pickett, Virginia. Camp Pickett, Virginia, where they gave you medical training. That's where I had my medical medic. training. How long did that last? I had uh, eight weeks of basic training. I had eight weeks of medical training uh, in which we learned to do most unorthodox things, uh, give shots, uh, attend to wounds. In, in rare cases, pull teeth, so just do suturing and things like that there. And then after your medical training, you were you went directly to Korea. I went to I went to Seattle, Washington, where I shipped out. After the medical training, we had 30 days of uh, leave. They sent us home because we, they knew, we knew where we were going, and uh, we went to Seattle, Washington, where there we boarded the the, the USS General Buckner which was a transport ship that took us over to Japan. And once in Japan, we landed in a, in a port in Yokohama, where then we were transferred to another place in the southern tip of Japan called Sasebo, Japan. That was a, a rebel depot. A rebel depot is a, a place where people are all herded in, and uh, they stay there until they decide where they want to put you. And um, uh, the day before we left for Korea, your fate was decided. Either you went to Japan, or stayed in Japan, or you went to Korea. And so you decided that before you actually shipped out whether you were going to be stationed in Japan or Korea? Did you was, know at that time? When the, beg your pardon? Did you know? I didn't know until we was going through the line. We was picking up. We, were, we left that night. It was, I don't know, it was late at night. And we had to go through a line where we picked up our rifles. And of course, I never had a rifle. Our, our gear, steel pots and all that stuff. And as you went through, you had your records. 
And as you went through, they would stamp your records either K or J, K or J. And uh, that's how you knew. You never had, you just said something that interests me. You never had a rifle at all? No. No. They, if you were a medic, you just were not issued rifles at all. No, and mostly because 99% of all the medics in the service are conscientious objectors. Uh, I was the only one that wasn't. But I never, I never, uh, Never got one and didn't, I didn't want one. It was my job. Okay, and um, so after from Seattle, you went to Japan, where you knew you weren't going to stay there. Oh. You knew you were going to Korea. How long did you have to stay in Japan, though? How did they go? Uh... I was only in Japan three days, and then uh, and, and we shipped out. Uh, it was only a time to get, every place you go in the Army, uh, your records are checked, you know, make sure you have the proper inoculations and so on. And, and, uh, and so um, once you got to Korea, where were you, where were you stationed? We landed in Incheon in Korea. Then uh, we went to a, a rebel devil. It was, it was in uh, a town called Yongdongbo. And a repo devil, once again, I said, is a place where they keep everybody uh, intact until you know where you're going. Well, uh, we were there. We landed in Yang Dung Po. We boarded a train, as I remember. It had old wooden seats in it and everything. And, and uh, we went from Incheon on through to Yang Dung Po, which was not very far away, maybe 12 or 14 miles. And uh, as we were going down, the train ride to Young Dung Po, we, we noticed how everything was blowed up and the city was leveled, everything was leveled there when we got there. And uh, of course we were a little scared because, uh, you know, we, we've not been in that type of environment, you know. And uh, when we got to Young Dung Po, uh, we were all unloaded there and went to the repel depot that night and our records were all checked. And uh, I remember basically that night it was snowing. It was awfully cold that night. And it gets awful cold in Korea. What, what uh, part of the year was this then? I'm sorry to interrupt. It was in 1953. During the month? I mean, winter, summer? It was in, as I recall, it was in the wintertime. It was in November. It was November of 53. Uh, <clears throat> we had we had kind of thought maybe that uh, <laughs> things were... Uh, of course, the worst part of the war was done from 50 to 52, the worst part of it. Um, so we weren't expecting to get really engaged in anything really big. At least we didn't think so. We didn't think we were. And um, so anyway, uh, the next morning I was called out and I was assigned to a 30th medical group, which was assigned to the 8th Army. And uh, I was sent to Seoul, Korea where I became a medical corpsman at the 48th Mesh Hospital in Seoul, Korea, where they were taking care of sick, wounded, and uh, uh, soldiers who had come in confrontation with the enemy and so on. And uh, that was a whole new experience. Um, I was, it, it was most unusual how they, got, how they got the patients in there. They had a flying in by helicopter. They would take a, pa a, a person who would get wounded, on, wounded would be transported to an aid station. And then from there, he would be transported to a battalion aid station where they would put him on a helicopter, a bubble-type helicopter with stretchers on the left and on the right side of the helicopter where they would strap the stretcher on and put the bubble over the person's head so he wouldn't be affected by the flight. And that's how we got the men in from the front line of the, uh, the hospital. Well, uh, that was my first experience. Uh, and uh, while I was there, uh, I, I was there about a month at the 48th Mash Hospital. And um, a lot of things were learned that day. Uh, for instance, uh, I don't know how many people knew about it, but we had a big catastrophe in Korea that a lot of people never knew about. There was a disease that was going around there called hemorrhagic fever. Very few people knew about it. They know about it today. 
but then it was killing more of our soldiers than what the bullets were. And uh, the government uh, brought in scientists from Norway, Sweden, all over the world to find out what was causing this, this terrible disease, because you would die. Within a week, you'd be dead. There was no cure, I mean. There was no cure for it. They would run high fever, the blood pressure would go out of range, and uh, there, were just no, there was just no cure for it. And they were dying left and right. And um, uh, I was there at the hospital for about two months, taking care of the, the sick and wounded and everything. And then a call came down, very funny. <laughs> there was a Catholic priest in the in the uh, 48 Mash Hospital. Name was Father Rico. He was from uh, the Boston Diocese, and uh, he was trying to find some Catholic boy that would assist him for a few weeks as his older boy. And uh, evidently he looked on my records and found out that I was Catholic and he said, he came to me and asked me if I wouldn't assist him for three weeks if, if he could get permission from the headquarters. And I said, yes. I said, my Latin wasn't very good in those days we used the Latin. He said, well, that's no problem. He said, I can work with you on that. And of all the experiences I had, that was the most interesting experience because uh, the orders came down that, and they let me go for three weeks. What I didn't know was that on Sunday, well, you know how we go to church here on Sunday. Well, Father, <laughs> he would drive uh, several miles up in the front line. And uh, <laughs> his altar was a, was, was a, a deuce and a half truck, two, two and a half ton truck. And he would, uh, when he come to a place where there would be a gathering of 12 or 14, or mo most of maybe 20 at the most, men that wanted to go to, to uh, mass, he would uh, drop the back of the bed down and make his altar out of that and uh, put on his vestments and everything. And it's, it would say mass for him there. And we did that in some pretty cold weather Sunday. And, uh, so three weeks of that there was a quite an experience for me. Uh, and to this day I'm still trying to find him because he was such a lovable person. He may be dead by now, I guess, because I was only 21 then. You know, he would, I mean, he would do this every day. It wasn't just on... Well, in the day, on the weekends we would go on the lines, up on the lines okay. where they couldn't get to a priest. Okay. Father had a chapel within the Mage Hospital where okay. we'd have mass every day. And... Uh, and that was that. Well then, after that time came, after about two months, that 1st Marine Division, which had been on line up above the parallel, uh, 30th parallel, very, very, well, the DMZ, was three miles behind the DMZ, the demilitarized zone. They were ordered to, to, to come back to, uh, to come home after being on line so, many, so long. Well, the 24th Division, in 1950, went over to Korea with the 1st Marine Division and 25th Division. And uh, uh, <laughs> i got to tell you the history of it. <laughs> uh, the 24th Division was, uh, they were massacred there. <laughs> Take your time. Would you like me to turn the camera off for a minute? No. Okay. Sorry. Just take your time. I'll be all right. Anyway, um, what was left of the 24th Division, <coughs> I went, went back to Japan and uh, to regroup. And uh, and uh, for two years, they, it took them a long time to rebuild that, uh, that division back up again. So, I got orders, well anyway, the 24th Division was ordered back to Korea to take over the 1st Marine Division's place on, on the demilitarized zone. And once again, they had no medics. So there I got my first experience. And uh, I got my orders cut to, to join the 24th Division up there. So, uh, and uh, you know, you wouldn't think much about being 
You know, they signed the armistice, but it didn't end there. It's still going on. Uh, we went, That night, I was picked up by a deuce and a half truck and two other men, and we were sent, it took us an all night journey to get up there to the, to the, to Chun Chong, which was the 38th parallel, and I, I thought we were there, but he said, no, he said, we got 12 more miles to go. And Korea is a very mountainous, mountainous region, awfully mountainous. And um, while we were there, I, I joined, uh, there were some incidents that did happen. We came under fire as we were going, going up there. I hate to interrupt you again, yeah. but had the armistice been signed by now? The armistice was signed before I got there. Really? Okay. Uh, and and, and I, want, I, may, I may actually point this out before we get going. Uh, any computer operator, if you just type in the 24th Infantry Division on the computer, it'll take you back to, on the page, it'll show you that the DM, the demilitarized zone in the every year that we've had it, up to 2003, as late as 2003, there's still confrontations going on. And they're going on every year, but we don't hear about it. Anyway, we uh, we got into a confrontation up there. As we were going up there to uh, where the 13th Field Artillery Battalion was. That was the group that wanted the medic, needed the medics, because there wasn't very many up there. And uh, we came into an ambush uh, on the way up there. And uh, I was wounded twice in the ambush. Uh, <laughs> and, and you can figure, measure how I was a, a young man uh, from the States and didn't know anything about this stuff, you know. Never expected to be up there. In fact, when you go in the service, you don't expect to do what they train you to do. But anyway, we got through that, and uh, we reported up there to the 13th Field Artillery Battalion. There, I don't know what, they have a hill number for everything, but I, this one didn't have a hill in it. Anyway, we were a backup force to the demilitarized zone, which was three miles directly north of us or ahead of us. This was a, a field artillery battalion of, of consisted of uh, 105 howitzers, cannons. And they're the backup fire in case anything would ever happen at the demilitarized zone, which there's always something going on up there. And then um, I, I spent a lot of time there with a lot of problems with men stepping on landmines and what have you, you know. and. Uh, they were all over. You mentioned you were wounded twice during yes. this journey. Yes. How were you treated? I mean, you didn't seem to take any time off. I was treated there when I got. They got me to the to the to the medics were the at the 13th Field Artillery Battalion. Uh, they weren't. No, they were they were serious, but they weren't that serious. Anyway, uh, going back to what I was saying. Um, the demilitarized zone. A lot of people don't know about the demilitarized zone. There's as many people in North Korea that want to come south for freedom as, as there are anywhere in the world. But the trouble is you don't know who's who. So therefore, if, if anyone's been to the demilitarized zone, they have to know how it, how it works. Uh, there's two fences up there and uh, we're on one side and they're on their side. There's a gateway between us and them, and there's a guard there, and uh, just anything will, will touch off a problem. And uh, many nights up there, Korean, North Korean people, they're starving to death over there, of course, we all know that. And they try to get to South Korea for freedom to have a better life. And at nighttime, uh, because they either, they either get caught coming or they get caught going, one of the two. But there's people in Korea to this day, as like when I was there, that just never believed in the armistice signing. They never did believe in the armistice signing. Uh, I think this book depicts it more than anything else. Uh, but anyway, 
I spent 16 months up there with the 24th Infantry Division. I stayed there until 1955, I believe it was, 1955. Uh, of course, my experiences was after we were online so many months. After after six months, we all got what they call R and R, which would take us back to Japan, where we were able to live a decent life for five days. Never had any milk or whatever other than the, the recombined milk. But some of the things that while I was there. I talked to some veterans and who I had met during our anniversary period. We've had an anniversary period from year 2000 to 2003, which just ended in September, which was uh, the commemoration of the 50th year of the Korean War. And I have met numerous veterans that I've seen over there that I've met here. As a matter of fact, I was reunited with one of my comrades at uh, Warren, Michigan. I didn't know it. Which was, uh, and we still keep in touch every week. <laughs> and uh, two things that I remember that I have, I like to talk about because I, this book depicts it. You know, we uh, that there's there's a, this book shows you about men who won the Silver Star, Bronze Star, real heroes of the war. And, you know, a lot of times, and prior to the anniversary, a lot of Korean veterans, in fact, I would never talk about it, I'd never display anything I had from Korea, because uh, didn't feel like we was welcome home when we come home. But since the anniversary, I have my all my things on the wall at home, displayed well, very proud. Very proud member now of the Korean Veterans Association, and uh, and sometimes I wonder why we were so lucky. Like, for instance, maybe I wasn't. I should have been there in 1950, 51, 52, but I wasn't. I was there in 53. And I was wondering sometimes why am I here and those guys aren't here. Well, <laughs> it took a long time uh, to realize why. I know why now. It's because. That's why I'm here. It's because that uh, as our Lord had disciples, so do these guys have disciples? Uh, they went through a very, very bad time. And uh, one of the bad times, the worst war, the worst fighting ever done in Korea was done to the Chosan Reservoir. As a matter of fact, we have one of our POWs that was there that survived that. The Chosan Reservoir was located in North Korea, just south of the Yalu River, where the 1st Marine Division went in and the 25th Division and the 2nd Army. It was in the dead of winter in 1950. They fought in temperatures of 45 below zero. Wind chills were 75 below zero. Uh, they, they fought for three weeks. Uh, they didn't eat, couldn't eat because there was no food. The food was froze, the water was froze, their guns were froze. Frostbite was numerous. And that's another thing I, I, I've seen at the 48 Mage Hospital, the frostbite cases, it was unbelievable. And uh, while I was at the reunion in Washington last July, I met General Raymond Davis. General Davis was a, a major in World War II in the South Pacific. And he was called back to uh, Camp Pendleton uh, just before the Korean War, and he was told that he had to uh, he had five days to uh, get 750 volunteers to go into Korea to this invasion of Chosan Reservoir. Well, he did so, and he went over there, and uh, and it was General Davis who I had talked to. And he told me about this his, this heroic stand that they had that day, and the guys that made it through. And then uh, in our organization, we have a, a magazine called the Graybeard. The Graybeard is our 
National Korean Veterans Magazine. And after I talked to him in July in Washington, he died in September. And then uh, the, re the last reunion we went to it was the last battle of Korea in 1953. Uh, in uh, Dayton, Ohio, I met Sergeant Robert Northcutt. Uh, he was Corporal Robert Northcutt then. And they were in the Battle of Porkchop Hill, the last battle, which was June 6, 1953, in Korea, before the armistice was signed. And uh, Sergeant Northcutt, or Corporal Northcutt then, uh, won the Silver Star for his heroic deeds. His company was pinned down in an area on Pork Chop Hill, and he was pinned down by enemy fire in a, in a sniper bunker. And, and he couldn't get his men out of there, and the only way he could do it was to go out in the line of fire and to uh, have the enemy fire at him and, and leave his men alone so, so he could possibly, if he survived, sneak around behind them to knock out the machine gun bunker, which he did. And he was wounded several times, but he was uh, awarded the Silver Star for his duties. So everybody in Korea played a part in this thing, you know. And even today, the young men that we have, the 23-year-old men that uh, are in there right now on the demilitarized zone, uh, I get letters from them all the time. And I just wish that sometimes the American government would be more fluent and, and, and honest with the American people and let them know what's going on over there because, yes, the armistice is signed, the, the ceasefire is signed, but there are still confrontations going on over there all the time. We're still getting wounded soldiers, we're not hearing about it. Well, anyway, when I left, when I left Korea in 1955, I was sent to Osaka, Japan, where they were in need of a, a medic at a, at a school in Kobe, Japan. It was called Roko Heights Elementary School. And uh, uh, I, I was, was, for some reason, I became pretty good at my trade. Uh, and they sent me there to, uh, the, to be a medical person to take care of the children there at that school. You know the little things the kids do. You know it was, it was just a way of. Uh, it was a place to be before I went home, and I stayed there about three weeks. I was supposed to have been flown home, because they promised me I'd be home because I was, I didn't do very good coming across the ocean on General Buckner, <laughs> but fortunately at Camp Drake I was there, uh, almost to my ETS was up, and they informed me that uh, I had to go back home again the same way I, I came over. And uh, it just so happened there was a ship there in the harbor called the USS General Pope, which, uh, which I boarded and I took 14 days to come back home. And needless to say, the boy from Indiana was still seasick all the way home. <laughs> we landed in Oakland Army Base in, in California, where we were flown to a, a base in New Mexico. And then we... Uh, from there, we was flown to Fort Sheridan, Illinois, where we were debriefed, debriefed given our money, and uh, and uh, and to check to see how the, everything was going. Because I was in the hospital several times over there when I was there. In Korea. In, in Tokyo Army Hospital, in I was Tokyo. flown from Korea to Tokyo Army Hospital, and uh, and back. So, uh, as a matter of fact, it's very strange because. <laughs> Uh, today I still have problems, and we 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 contacted the registry in St. Louis about my to get my medical records up here, <laughs> and evidently they were all burned up in a fire, so I have no medical records uh, or documentation of what happened. Uh, and then of course I came home. I spent six years in the reserves here. And, and I was discharged from the service in 1961. I was very happy to get home, but then when I was home, it, it was awful antsy to go back in again. I wanted to go back in so bad, but 
I couldn't, the reason why I didn't go back in the service again was because I couldn't go back where I wanted to go. I wanted to go back to serve a tour in the Far East Command in Japan. And they said I had to go to back to Korea for 18 months or, or stateside 18 months, one of the two. And I didn't want to do either one of those. So I committed to stay home. While you were in, in Korea, you were there a total of two years then? S 16 months 16 all total. 16 months all total. Yes. Um, and you were actually in, um, by the demilitarized zone, uh, quite Six, a bit of that time. 16 months. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, well, see, uh, let me think of it. 16 months. I was on the demilitarized zone for 12 months. Right, because I had four months. Well, see, we had eight weeks. To, we had eight weeks of medical school, and I had I had medical school over there too at the, at the hospital. So around a year or something. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, and you said, if I remember correctly, you, if, after six months, is it six months? You would be allowed R and R to go back to Japan. Yes, everybody okay. did. Um, but there was nothing in between then. You were just on duty for the whole six months. You're, yes. Okay. And. Uh, and. Uh, uh, talk about the basic standards of living uh, was more, <laughs> nothing like we're used to here. Uh, where we're at, you're used to if you get a if you got a shower once a month, you were doing good. And of course, uh, uh, mostly we, our food was mostly C rations. Sometimes we got Class A rations. Cooks would bring food to us on a on a two and a half ton truck. They would cook in the field. Is that class A rations when you talk about that? Oh. Yes, that was that was always a, a wonderful thing when you got that. And uh, the Red Cross would come up once in a while and bring us coffee and donuts and that stuff. And uh, and, and sometimes we get we'd get uh, special things like once in a while give it you once every two or three months you get three bottles of beer. That was wonderful. <laughs> but bought, I didn't drink. They actually bought it to you. They bought it to us. Three bottles of beer. But, uh, but I never drank it. I would did, never drink did, it. Have, were you able to keep in touch with your family back in the states during any of this yes. time? Yes, my mother. God love my mother. She wrote me all the time, and uh, my aunt uh, wrote me all the time, and they were always sending me boxes, which I appreciated muchly. I uh, always remember a good one from the boxes. That was. It was always packed in popcorn. I was, for some reason, she thought popcorn was the the preservative. And uh, of course, when you open up a box up over there, uh, if you got one bite out of whatever it was in there, you were lucky. You had to share it because it was what only. What kind of right. things would she send you? Oh, cookies, always cookies and candy bars and uh, some homemade, especially like our Italian cookies. She used to make all the time. But uh, like this, if you get one or two of them, you do it good. good. Hey, it's a box. <laughs> um, when you when you finally got back to your your home, yes, um, you said that uh, you didn't feel like you were welcomed. Did anybody even talk to you about it, or mm -hmm. no? No, just, just like you hadn't done it. No, that was the hard part. Your uh, your personality changes. In fact, uh, for about three years, I was. Uh, Quiet, you know. I, I'm, I'm always a, I'm always a talkative person, and uh, I just couldn't. I couldn't. I couldn't get myself back into the civilian life again. It was hard because of, you know, the, over there, uh, you don't know what's going to happen. You're always you're always on the edge of you don't know what's going to happen or when it's going to happen or how it's going to happen or anything. Uh, for instance, the first day, first night, the first night, the first week, no, it was, it was the second week I was there at the 13th Field Artillery Battalion. I got my first case. They called a medic. There was a convoy going through a, a pass. And uh, it was an American convoy. I, of course, I didn't know at that time. It was a, we had rock soldiers over there, Republic of Korean soldiers. Some of them were joined with us, some of them weren't. But uh, there was a, a convoy going through a pass. And um, and what happened was that one of the trucks was stopped. And, and now those passes over, we're talking about mountains. These are huge mountains. And uh, there was something, one of the, the Korean soldiers went back, South Korean soldiers, I want to reiterate, went back there to do something. Whatever happened, the truck slipped. 
and there was a winch in the back, and it caught him on the winch, and it went right through his, his abdomen. Of course, I didn't know this at the time. And then they called me up, and, 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 and another person to send us up there where he was at. Of course, that was my first case. <laughs> and he would say I was, oh, yeah. I never saw anything like that in my life. But that's where, uh, that's where we started to learn. And uh, sewing fingers on, guys were always getting their fingers caught in the breech block and cutting them off. <laughs> and, uh, and, and landmines were tremendous over there. Every place there was landmines, you didn't know where they were at. Where they found them, they would mark them off, but they were, you know, guys stepping on landmines all the time over there. And uh, wounded personnel. Uh, I guess I grew up there. <laughs> so really now, what's nice about this is this, that after that period of coming home, I guess I kind of knew what my dad was always telling me about. When I was 12 years old, he was marching me around the hospital, right, right shoulder, left shoulder, present arms, and I didn't know what it was all about. And uh, now I do. And. Uh, after my dad passed away, I got really involved in this thing. I loved the military. I always did love the military. But until the, until the war, uh, when the anniversary started in, in the year 2000, I didn't even know it. I didn't know the anniversary was on. This was the time for the closets to open up and for everybody to come out. When you got back to the States, um, what did you do? I mean, you took some time. You said it was very hard, difficult to adjust. Oh. But what about work or school or anything like that? All right. After I got out of the service, I was asked to come out to the Veterans Hospital in Fort Wayne. I went out to the Veterans Hospital. Uh, there was a, an Army nurse I knew. She wanted me to come out there to work and to learn. Out there we could learn a trade on, on as we were there. Well, I chose to be an X-ray technician because I thought that would be what I'd like to do. So I worked out there for two years at the Veterans Hospital. <laughs> and uh, getting to that plateau, uh, back in those days, uh, they only paid $4,800 a year. And that was under civil service. Well, I found out that uh, I couldn't live on $4,800 a year because I had other things I wanted to do. Had you married by this time? <sighs> I think a minute. No, I didn't get married yet. Let's see, when did I get married? <laughs> uh, no, I didn't get married until, guys, in the late, must have been late 60s, I think I got married. It was a marriage that didn't last very long, mostly because, I guess, because of me and getting adjusted and everything. And, uh, but then I did get married again in uh, 60, 63, I got married, and, and I'm still married to the same woman she put up with me. And uh, uh, we, uh, she, uh, she, I met her in uh, 1961 when Mr. John Kennedy, that was another thing too, when I came home from the service, I was very honored. My father was still, See, Dad was still alive then. He was the commander of one of the most beautiful color guards you've ever seen in your life. A color guard is a group of military men who have, are dressed in beautiful uniforms and they present the most fantastic military show you've ever seen with rifles. And, uh, and I was chosen to be in that. And uh, we were the, one of the top ten in the nation and always have been. Well, in 19... See if I get my dates right. 1961. No, it was before that because John Kennedy was inaugurated in '60. He was 59. John Kennedy, who was a senator then, came to Indiana, and he asked. Well, my, well he wasn't. My dad was asked to put on a show for him at the Shrine Auditorium, which we did. And uh, John Kennedy, he he was so overwhelmed with the show. He asked my father, he said, if I become president in 1960, he said, would you please come and march in the inaugural parade? And Dad said, yeah, he would. Well, John Kennedy became the president of the United States, and uh, I had the pleasure of marching in his inaugural parade. 
And then when we came home, before that, we're going to go back a little bit further. Harry Truman, before he died, he came to Fort Wayne to the Memorial Coliseum. We were asked to perform before President Truman. And that was a day of an honor. After the performance that night, my father, we were home. He lives in a little Italian community over there in the south part of Fort Wayne. He had a telephone call that one of his aides asked him to, to come to the Hotel Keenan. And uh, <laughs> I was a little emotional. He, uh, he asked to see my father, the president. He requested to see my father. And it was a great honor. And I said, Daddy, I said, I said, I said, Dad, I always call him Daddy. I said, can I go with you? I'd like to see the president. Well, I never got to see the president. He said, sure, come along. So we went. And they took us up to the top floor, I guess wherever the the VIP suite was in the Keenan Hotel back then. And uh, my dad, when he was summoned in, he got to go in and he was in the five minutes, maybe ten. He came back out and I was dying to say what did he say? What did he say? He said, all he said was, he said, he said, thank you for a great job well done. And uh, <laughs> so uh, I felt so good about that. And uh, that, that's been a story of my whole family because we've been involved with that stuff all our lives. You mentioned that um, you were, you when you got back to Fort Wayne that you, uh, went to the Veterans Hospital Yes. and took some training uh, to be a radiologist? No, uh, an x-ray technician. X-ray technician, yes. sorry. Um, and, but you said it wasn't paying you enough money. What did you do after that then? <sighs> uh, see, what did I, I got to think, you have to forgive me because my mind is blocked out for so many Take years. your time. <laughs> um, where did I go after well, the that? The only thing I was asking is, I, yes. I don't know whether you were entitled to the GI Bill and the benefits from that. Did you use any of that? Uh, you mean from the Korean? For, from the as a as a uh, result of serving. Uh, in yep, no, I didn't. I didn't do any. Didn't I didn't have the benefits? Wouldn't have uh, done me any good at the Veterans Hospital because it was a civil service project that oh, it was educating me there. Uh, the only things I, I've used out on my GI Bill was uh, uh, grants that I got from uh, for my daughter to go to college. And, uh, that was the only thing I ever used out of it because I didn't really. Well, like I say, right now the the Veterans Affairs are taking care of me now. Uh, my health care is taken by them. It doesn't cost me anything to to go there, and which I'm very thankful for. Did you join any of the um, organizations? I know you belong to the Korean Veteran War Association, but uh, like the American Legion or VFW? Yes, I belong to the American to Legion Post Number 82, which which was my father's home post, who was commander there. My brothers were commander there and everything. Uh, and I belong to the 24th Infantry Division Association, which is a very proud association. Uh, that's the tarot leaf, and uh, we we have reunions every year, and uh, of course they've been so far west the last two years we were unable to get there, hoping it'll come east. Uh, like for instance, we have one coming up in May called the Camp Kaiser Korea Reunion, and uh, it's in New Jersey, and we're going to go to to make that. Uh, you're always hopeful that you're going to see somebody, you know, because uh, in my experience from being home, I've been trying to find all my buddies, and uh, it's almost impossible. Either they were killed, or, or they're not on the registry, or they're not registering their names or something, except for this one friend I had. And thank God for my daughter; she's the one that found him. Uh, he was an Italian person. They was with me at the Fortieth Hospital. 48 Mates Hospital. And he later on went on to 3rd Division. He was an infantryman and uh, he uh, he was in very serious combat even in 1953. <laughs> and uh, he lives in East Point, Michigan. His name was Ernest Buffili, a very fine person. 
uh, we were, like I said, we were united back in March at Warren, Michigan reunion, and uh, we spent the weekend there with his family, and uh, we traded old photos and and talked about things, you know. And uh, uh, I said, don't ever. <laughs> I said, we don't want to ever lose contact again. He said, we won't. And we don't. Mr. Janney, thank you for, um, before I do that, there was a, uh, we're about to finish up here. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Something that um, I, either I didn't ask you or something in your experience that uh, you think is important for people to know? Yes. You know, uh, like I, I was telling you about this magazine. This was given to us by our Department of Defense in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, I can't speak for these guys because I weren't there, but these gentlemen here faced probably one of the worst times of our history. Uh, weather, fighting. We have several pictures in here of, of men, just soldiers, but were heroes beyond the imagination of anybody and I'm so proud that that I can be here today for one reason that is to talk about it for them because a lot of them never came back and uh, we were fortunate not so much that we came back but we were uh, we experienced this a little bit of what they did but not quite what they did but we can talk about it we can tell the next generations about it because the history books, I hope one day, will record what happened in Korea. And one thing has amazed me since I've been home, i got to say this. The Korean community has accepted us as heroes, no matter who you are. Every year here in Fort Wayne, we're invited to the Korean Thanksgiving. Every place we went in the United States at these reunions, the Korean people were there. And they would say thank you. Thank you for defeating communism and thank you for being who you are and giving us freedom in a country <laughs> that you came to that you never seen before and for people that you never met. And that made my day. God bless all the Korean people because they love us and we love them. Mr. Union, I'd like to add my thanks, our thanks to that. Thank you. Um, what you've done today is very important. It's very important for people to hear. And uh, again, thank you. Thank you very much. It's been an honor.